So 16 Lovers Lane, mm -hmm. where did you get the title from? The title um, came from an idea that I had. And it was, um, I was just interested in the idea of, you know, a lot of people talk about Lovers Lane. And I, and I was, I wanted to get specific on it. You know, like where? You know, is it 16? Is it 140? Um, and so I, I came up with, I think the one that I had, I can remember like a band meeting, and, and I came up with um, like 152 L Lover's Lane or, you know, 121C Lover's Lane. And I threw this into the meeting and uh, Amanda got annoyed and she went, oh, why don't you just call it 16 Lover's Lane? And everyone went, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's where it came from. At that time, you know, the late 80s, I suppose everybody was sort of in their late 20s as well, you know, mm. you were kind of feeling like, hey, it's going to happen now. Mm. It's a very up record. It is, it is a very up record, but, I mean, it was going to happen now. You know, like, we'd already done, you know, Cal and Canaan before Hollywood in 1983. You know, we'd already done um, Spring Rain and Liberty Bell in 85, 86. So we'd actually already gone twice around where we'd done a really good lead single, we'd done a really good album, and both times it had been really good for our career. So we'd already done that twice. So it wasn't like like 16 Lovers Lane was this huge burst and and Streets of Your Town was this huge first time we'd ever put a, a really commercial s single to a sort of commercial album. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I... I, you know, I think we'd, we'd sort of done it a, a few times, but, um, yeah. Um, I guess the, the principal thing with the go-betweens really is that sort of, um, is the relationship between you and Grant. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, beginning to end, that's really what it was about. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of wanted to talk about that kind of a, a little bit, I suppose, mm -hmm. in, in sort of retrospect. I mean... What was it about Grant that you felt, you know, completed you or made... Um, what was it about the relationship that you really treasured? Um, that he was a... Um, almost beyond songwriting, he, he was a... Um, the first phrase that comes to my mind, which is not... which is going to sound dreadful, he was an intellectual equal. He, he was the first person I'd ever met that had the movie magazines, the rock magazines, the film posters on the wall, could talk fluently about rock, film, books, poetry, you know. And, and before that, I'd met smart people, but, you know, they might be engineering students or, you know, like they might be doing medicine or, you know, they, a, a variety of things. But he, he was the first person that I guess um, had... A, uh, was a field of interest that I was interested in and was like right up to it, to a level that I thought I was. Um, and he had more things than I had because he had this whole thing with film that I didn't know about. But that was the main thing, you know, and I think that went through our songwriting and our friendship. It, it, it was two people that met, you know, when we were 18 or 19. And, you know, I knew Grant two years before, we, we, before I showed him how to play bass, you know. We were friends for two years at university. And and um, and just sort of kicking around and and um, it was um, you know meet, meeting you know someone who I thought was you know as smart and offbeat and and intelligent or searching a searcher he was a searcher like me and you had already started playing the guitar so you obviously had an interest in that area yeah so had you always planned to you were going to be um a singer, songwriter, rocks and roll star? No. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, I, I had fantasies about, you know, being a, you know, like everyone, like novelist, filmmaker, you know, when I was 18, like ridiculous, you know. Um, like, every, you know, you think you're Orson Welles, you know, you're, you're 19 and, and, uh, and it was almost like I was playing guitar with some university friends, <coughs> school friends. It was almost like it was like so much in front of my face but we weren't doing gigs or anything, but it was so much, I didn't really think about it. And, and then the band started, you know, I just it was in this band 
who never played, we played three shows over two years, um, between 75 and the end of 77. And, and I just started to write songs for it. <coughs> and then <coughs> I wrote um, Lee Remick and Karen really quite quick um, at the end of 77. It was suddenly like, you know, it just, it just burst in front of my eyes. And, and I suddenly, I, I knew en enough about rock music to know that these were really good songs. And, and the band I was playing with in that we were rehearsing all the time were mainly exclusively doing covers, and just a couple of songs that I started to write for the band. And then it just suddenly, I became a songwriter. And Grant actually saw that the last two, two gigs the band ever played. And the last two gigs the band ever played, we did Karen. And he saw that. <coughs> and uh, so that's sort of where it started. So you went off and did the po uh, went off to the mm. UK, did the yeah. postcard thing. How did you find that? D did you sort of feel that you were citizens of the world? Um, yeah. We did, I, you know, to be perfectly frank, we didn't sort of, in our mind, in our... Our, our frame of mind to be citizens of the world would have had to be, at, when we're thinking at that time, would have had to be in New York, you know, that would have completed it. Um, but um, we, we had to get over there because Grant and I just were of an age where we wanted to travel more than anything else. And uh, we were buying records and buying magazines, you know, fierce consumers. And um, we, we, we just had to get to the centre of action. And 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 you know get to the feeding even closer you know and 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 we knew it would be good for our development too to be in the centre of it even if we were unknown it was good to be there when the records were coming out and seeing bands four or five times a week. Can you tell me that story about going to Sydney for the pressing and the the striped sunlight sound story? We um yeah we we um this is um th I'll, I'll give you a slightly longer. What, what happened was, I'll give you a, a longer thing of it. You, you won't use it, but anyway. Bob Dylan gave his first major interview for about two or three years to Playboy magazine. And this was in late 77, early 78. Um, and, and Grant and I were like, had, you know, Dylan bootlegs, read Dylan interviews, you know, um, were obsessives. And, um, and Playboy was banned in, uh, in Queensland. And uh, Grant and I knew what issue it was. And also, it was a, we just recorded Lee Merrick and Karen. And we were, um, it was, and it was down in Sydney. The tapes had been sent down in Sydney, and there was a whole problem with sort of phoning up the pressing plant, and you know, like we've lost the tape, so you know, something. And Grant and I just decided on the spur of the moment, let's drive down there and let's just, you know, this is how desperate we were. Let's go down there, let's drive down to Sydney and go to the pressing plant and make sure everything was okay. It coincided that when, when we drove through Tweed Heads, we just crossed the border. This is in my car, you know, Grant, Grant there, me there. Um, we, we'd cross, and news that you can buy Playboy. And so we went in and there was the Dylan issue. And so we, we started driving on from Coolangatta and, um, and Grant is reading it, you know, and I'm driving like, like this and Grant, Grant starts to read it. And it comes to where, where, where they, the interviewer asked Dylan about um, the Blonde on Blonde and High 61. And, uh, and a lot of writers over the years, rock writers, have tried to describe this sound, you know, this unique sound. And, and Dylan called it the Wild Mercury sound, you know. And it became instantly famous, you know. It's, it's some, you know, like, it's, it's gold and blah, 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 whatever that conjures up. Beautiful phrasing. And, like, Dylan came up with it. And Grant was reading this to me, and, you know, and, and Grant and I go, that's fantastic. That is just so incredible. You know, like Dylan describes his sound better than the rock critics, and this wild mercury sound. That's a wild mercury sound. And then we, you know, like and I, and and that sort of came up the idea of us. Well, we've we, we've got to describe our sound. You know, <laughs> if Dylan's done that, then we've got to do this. And and so you know, like we came up with the striped sunlight sound, and we put that description on on our first record. You know, and it was inspired by that that interview, and Grant read the whole interview as I was driving, you know, like for hours, Grant's reading this. It was, it was quite a moment. There, there's obviously a partnership mm -hmm. there, not to 
distract from any of the other mm, members sure. who were in the band or whatever. But there is obviously a, a, like a songwriting partnership there. And mm. though you didn't particularly write together, mm -hmm. it was like two sort of parts of a mm. kind of a yin and a yang -y thing. Mm. Do you mm. think that's the case? That yeah. Um, but it, it, it wasn't something that um, we really discussed or thought about. We, we were just trying to write songs and we were in very close proximity to each other. And so it was um, it was like that, you know, like a lot of a lot of a lot of I guess at the start, even you know, we'd we'd know people in bands or, you know, two two guitar players in bands and they'd see each other maybe once every three weeks. Um, but Grant and I would see each other virtually every day and play, you know, and it was um and always struck me as strange, you know, like, you know, why isn't everyone playing all the time, you know? And, but that was just something that we had. We, we were just, and it wasn't even, we were just bitten by the bug of, of the songs and, and playing guitar. And um, it's, it seemed to me at an early stage that him and I could do something, we could take on the world, that we could do something. Even very early, there was an, an energy there, there was uh, a precociousness there um, that we could do it. And Lindy picked up on this. You know, she said this in interviews. She could see that, you know, there was a lot of people doing stuff around town, but she could see um, what we were doing and the, and the drive and the ambition there. I don't know if this is really true or not, but it also seems to me that there was a sort of... Uh, a kind of... Bearing in mind that, you know, you educated people and understand irony and all that kind of stuff but there's also a kind of a, a bit of a naive sort of love of show business yeah and you know you all always cited the monkeys as an influence mm. and in, in a sense the go-betweens seem to be that sort of thing you know where the, everybody's all living together and making music together all the time you know and mm. it's like mm. do you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah 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 i i didn't thought of that and yeah that's true i mean the monkeys were were we we had like especially at the start, and I think it stayed away, very romantic notions of bands. You know, it, it was like there almost had to be the go-between mobile outside. You know, it, it, was, it was like, you know, the, the absolute cruelest thing that you could say when you're 22 years old, what do you do? I'm in a band. You know, it was, it, nothing was better than that. And, and, and it was all that sort of, you know, and being in a band meant to us like the Hollies, you know, or... or um, the love and spoonful, you know? It's like the photos, the look. Um, and that's what we found when we met bands like, say, Orange Juice, totally into it as well, you know? I, I think all great bands are, you know? I think you too are, are like that. I, I think um, there's, there's a, the mystery of the band um, is high, you know? And, and we had that. And you get to live in your own kind of world in a way. You do, you do. <laughs> Good and bad thing. Yeah. But you kind of end up like the mamas and the papas. Well, we, it's, see, it's strange you say that because I was, when I was listening to, um, I, I listened to 16 Lovers Lane today before I came down, and, um, and I, I knew how much, like Grant especially loved mamas and the papas. And when I was listening to the album, I was going, this is, you know, like you're talking before about Sonny and Sydney, um, because obviously Sydney, in my mind, I know Grant felt this as well. Sydney and LA, you know, like very similar, you know, like in terms of relations, the city to the country, to both of them. Um, very like twin cities. And, and I was listening to 16 Lovers Lane today and I was thinking about Grant's love for the mamas and the papas and I was going, this is like a mamas and papas vibe coming off this record, you know, listening to it. And uh, yeah, it's true. Because people, people are always going, about the, it's the Rumours album, but it's actually more mamas and the papas. It is, than it, is it is, it is. It is. It's you know, it's young girls coming to the canyon. It's it's it. But it, and it's it's that um, yeah. It's again you know talking about you know sunlight. That that was there in Sydney, you know, and and uh, and just the way the the records produced, the, the sound of it, which is quite um, you know, it's not a thumping bass and drums album. It's a very listening to it today. It's 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 there, it's a lot of it's quite toppy and high with a lot of melody on top like an LA pop record from the 60s in a way you know so okay so we've got this sort of we've got this sort of axis of, of you and Grant and then Lindy comes into it how does that sort of affect the the thing 
Um, affects it on a number of areas. Musically, you know, she's obviously, um, her, her drumming is formed by really post-punk drumming. Um, and, um, and it sort of coincided when, when Grant and I went into uh, that sort of mood, you know. It, 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 it was like, Grant and I always liked, you know, punk rock is, is hard to describe in terms of the, the go-betweens. And the, 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 we, we loved the New York bands, obviously. You know, Television, Talking Heads, Ramones, Blondie. We had all their records. And, and the English punk, you know, I, you know, I don't find all that strong. And so, and, and, and we liked the 60s stuff. And, and it just sort of got to the stage where we, we sort of, we, we, we couldn't keep going on with, with you know, like, like trying to be the love and spoonful, you know, in, in although, though, you know, like we go to Glasgow and, you know, that's, you know, and that whole thing's there. But it, it's sort of, we, 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 we sort of deconstructed the band in a way, is, is around 1980 and just, and, the, you know, that more sort of, definitely more jagged post-punk thing, Grant and I just went that way, you know, like it, it just, we couldn't keep going, you know, it had to go to New Frontiers. Otherwise, the band was just going to become, you know, like a stuck. And so Lindy was was there at that time, and and she that's her drumming was in that style, and it and it, and it welded with what um, um, Grant and I, you know, like where we're going. So, how did were you sort of kind? I mean, obviously, having a it's a number of things, I suppose. One of them is, is this whole gender issue. I mean, was that, in, was that a, a factor, having a woman drummer? Um, yeah, it was always our dream. Always our dream. Um, it was like, um, you know, it was like, you know, Jules and Jim, you know. Um, it was like Mod Squad, you know. That's what Grant and I were, were aiming for. And so a woman in the band was always... Um, if Grant had played drums, we would have had a woman bass player. You know, it was that sort of trade-off. But like Jules and Jim, the romantic complications. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how did that sort of work out? Um. Okay. Um, difficult times as it has to be. I mean, any any band, any in the world where. Um, in hindsight, you say you'd say it, it sort of went fairly well. Um, you know. Two people are forming a band, another person comes into the band and a relationship starts between, you know, the new person and one of the people. I mean, you can put any three people in the world and that's that's gonna cause some problems. Um but um overall I thought it it, it worked okay, you know, like we we were both we we're all three of us wanting to make music, we were dedicated to the band. Um we didn't have any money, um, which is a great leveller. You know, and um, we were just, but it, it um, you know, it was probably at the right time for, for, for you know, um, for Grant and I, that, that hot period of, of our friendship, you know, like I'd known him from 76 and, you know, and really, you know, Lindy joins the band and, and, um, um, and her and I, you know, like start going out together. Um, you know, like, really, um, in, in 1981. So that's five years that I'd known Grant. And it was time for me and him and I to just sort of open up to the world and, and, and we'd, 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 the band was going, you know, like, um, we'd already made a couple of singles, we'd already been overseas. It was time to start to, you know, go out to the world more. Those are kind of quite big decisions, though, because obviously Grant and Lindy famously didn't, weren't the closest of yep. friends. So, you know, he has to kind of share you mm. and so does she. Mm. So it must have, you know, I mean, that's, that can be quite tense. Is that, does that help or hurt the, or is it relevant to the artistic process? It must have um, 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 hurt him to an, ex an extent, but I think it, it also freed him up. You know, like um, he, he had friends and, and uh, you know, um, there, were, there were people that were always attracted to Grant, you know, um, male, female, you know, 
um, intelligent, witty, uh, educated man, you know. There seemed to be that kind of a tension in the records. Were you sort of aware of that? The, that, that kind of what? Well, there seemed to be a kind of a tension, those two sort of poles. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And, and, and actually, I think um, that tension sort of probably reached its height in Tallulah. And, um, and both Grant and I knew that. And I think, I think this was one of the things that curved us into 16 Lovers Lane that I can't remember at the time if Grant and I actually talked about it but I think we both felt it, we might have talked about it, that um, we needed to bring the, bring the vision in a bit more. You know, like it, it, it had to, we both felt that it, it, it was a bit too wide and hit and miss, a bit disparate to Lula. And, and it needed to, we needed to, it needed to be different, but like um, before Hollywood, which was a more a bound group of songs, more bound group of songs on Liberty Bell, and Tallulah had got very divergent, and and it, it needed to um, come in. Like that's something that, that we learned from that record. What, what you're talking about. Um. So you seem to come back from that sort of from the sort of more um, complicated, more poetic, more arty songs mm. into something that was a bit more direct. Was yes. that a conscious thing on your part at that yes, time? Yes, it was. Um, I think um, part of us leaving London, you know, London encourages that, you know, uh, that more sort of flamboyant, decadent stuff. And uh, I'd started to listen to a, um, Guy Clark, who was a, uh, a Texan singer-songwriter who used um, economy and, a, and a, 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 a better sort of strength of line that I thought I had, and who was sort of more writing about things around him, um, they just melt a little bit more to the heart, you know, um, that I wanted to get to. And, yeah, those things. And, and, and records I was listening to, I, I just sort of turned a little bit more away from that. I remember I heard a, a record in London, this was like in 87, by Rodney Crowell, you know, like, oh, I didn't really never listen to any of that. And suddenly, I don't know how that popped into my orbit, you know, where you're listening to Jesus and Mary Chain or the Smiths or, you know, like all the stuff that's going on around, the, you know, all around the world and stuff. And suddenly, you know, you, I started to listen to a little bit Graham Parsons, you know, and, with, you know, the records he made with Emmylou Harris. And it just started to turn a bit. And I started to, Guy Clark, you know, Graham Parsons, you know, Rodney Corral, it just brought me around a bit. Because, you know, Visions of Blue and a song called Clouds, it's very Joni Mitchell, isn't it? Or is uh, it unintentional? Unintentional. Un yeah, unintentional. Are you a Joni Mitchell fan? No. <laughs> really? No. Hideously overrated. But anyway, Not even Blue? It. Pardon? Not even Blue? Blue's, blues, um, blues good. Blue's, blue's good. Blue's good. She's dreadful. Have you read the latest r interview with her and... There's an interview in, in one of the magazines. You know, she's just self-opinionated, -opinion horrible, horrible. Puts down, uh, puts down, actually, you know, like Anne Sexton and Sylvia Plath. I was never into that, you know, suicide chic. You know what I mean? Horrible, horrible people. Did you always read poetry? No. Um, no, not really. Um, but I got into her, I don't know how. Um, but, but, but she was... Um, and it went on, like uh, Danger in the Past is the, the next album, that, that my solo album is again very much into, into both Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton a great deal. It's very, it's very, um, very, um, very emotive, but, but like almost hard boiled, you know, like the way that Plath can be, you know, and, and Sexton. It's very sort of, you know, it's not sweet. And it's very um, fireworks in the poetry. Um, and at this point, you know, at this point with Grant's writing, he'd, he'd reached this point of a sort of uh, an amazing sort of pop facility, yep. almost a voice and heart pop facility. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he also had this kind of a, a melancholy there, yeah. a darkness somewhere. Yes. Do you, what do you think about that? 
I, I think the melancholy is right at the heart of him. I think, um, and especially, you know, like since um, he's died, it, um, it's, you see it even more. You know, I saw it there, like right from the word go. And, and, and the fact that of his passing brings it out even a little bit more because you're dealing with the sadness of him gone. But his work, it's, 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 it's a, you know, you could virtually say it's at the centre of um, his songwriting, you know. And, yeah, it's at the centre of his songwriting. Because there's a sort of a, a kind of an un... You know, Grant w was extremely outgoing, but yeah. had a million friends everywhere, mm. uh, knew anything, could talk to anybody at any yes. point in time. Yes, yes. But there was a sort of... A, an unknown part of Grant that he, yes. that you know, was really just there. I mean, were you aware of that? Did you ever yes. get close to that? Where it came from, I don't know. Um, um, I think you know he he lost his father when he was very young, and I think um, that's a good starting point for a lot of what he was, you know, um, and what he wrote about. Um, it was always, um, in the 80s, you, you didn't see it as much. You know, he was flying, you know, he was a young man. Uh, he was in his 20s, you know. And, and when you're in your 20s, you've got, you know, as you know, you've got tons of energy. Um, you're moving at a great rate and you're not really reflecting. You know, the great, you know, the great reflecting years haven't hit you yet, you know. So you, you didn't really sort of see it all that much. In his personal behaviour and his work, although it's always there, but but uh, um, around this time it, it starts to become more becomes more in his work. Because it was the other curious thing about the perception of the group was that you were kind of the, the sort of more flamboyant kind of uh, out there artistic, less grounded type, mm. and the Grant was kind of you know the denim jacket, mm. you know mm. the work boots. Mm. The country and western records mm. he'd have a pickup if he mm. drove mm. And, and actually the reverse was kind of yes, true yes um which grant and i both knew uh and which we found as time went on more and more amusing in a, in a way uh yeah he it was um although you know like in periods um in in the 80s um it was probably more as, as, as time time went on I think, and we're going beyond um, like the album here, but I think as, as our lives went into our 30s and our 40s, it became even more so. Probably around 16 Lovers Lane and the 80s, you know, like we're in our late 20s, very, very early 30s or 30, it's, it's still pretty much, um, you know, it's that, that difference is not so much there. Uh, but it, it becomes more as we get older, where I'm seen as being something, but in a way, um, I'm happily married, and, and I, I I have a very happy personal life, and and basically I'm in bed by 9:30 reading, and um, people think that what Grant's doing in a bar at 11 or 12 o'clock with people around him, you know, just sparkling, is me, but it's the other way around. So he lives my life. He lives my life exactly, exactly. So um, so. Uh, the, the album comes out. How did you end up on the REM tour? They liked the band. They they liked the Go Betweens. Simple as that. What was that like? Um, very, very, very interesting. Very <coughs> interesting. Um, first time I looked up close, they were about to burst through at the big rock machine, you know. Um, and um, as a band, I found them great. R lovely, lovely people. Um, or, I mean, I think about it now. This is amazing. We played Festival Hall in Brisbane, right? And, um, you know, to four or 5,000 people. The with REM. With REM. Right, and we supported them. But they were, um, they were obviously... Um, it was good to, to see their manager with them their crew that they already had in place. It was the American, very friendly, but the American 
rock machine ready to go. And you, and you saw that right up close. Very interesting. The edge from U2 was singing your praises. Yeah. You called Love Is Lane one of the albums of the year or whatever it right. was. So you were quite comfortable. You, know, you must have, It must have also seemed like you know, a, a very good place to be. It was. Um, it was, but um, the, um, they, they had, they both, both these bands that you mentioned, U2 and R.E.M., um, had one big advantage in that they'd made a whole lot more ground in America than we'd done. We'd, we'd, we'd you know, a thousand people in America knew us, you know, 500 of them rock critics, you know. At the end of that process, you came back to Australia. How long was it before you started writing the next record? The next record, what do you mean the record after Six in Love's Lane? Yeah, yeah, Bondo Road. Um, um, how, how soon? Um, I didn't come back. I, I stayed in Germany. Um, the band came back. Uh, and I, I came back after the REM tour, you know. Um, and we played some solo shows in uh, Europe in the middle of 1989. So we're doing some shows with REM and some of our own. And the rest of the band went back. And I stayed in Europe um, uh, with my um, um, new German girlfriend who became my wife. And uh, so I stayed there for about three months through the summer writing it. And then I went back around October 89. And you were obviously, you and Grant were doing the demos for the next go between the record the whole machine was still yeah, going yeah 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 we we did um we did the the bondi 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 um uh, botany tapes they're called um in um um bondi junction yeah we we grant and i did with tony cohen tony cohen came up and did uh some demos on a four track in bondi junction with grant and i playing a lot of songs we had and at some point during that sort of demoing, songwriting process, you felt that it was time to put the band to rest? No. Um, we, we did the demos. I was there for about a month, and then I went back to Germany for about another month. Um, and then we came back. The band, you know, it was starting to... We were almost putting off doing the next record. You know, it was like... You know, the gears should have been moving. You know, who's producing it? And it just wasn't... Everyone, everyone was fairly flat. Um, and there just didn't seem to be the energy to... OK, you know, let's go and, and, and do that next record. You know, which you always do with every record. Up until then, including um, 16 Lovers Lane, it was always, OK, let's all go. And this was the first one where I was flying back to Germany. Um, you know, who was going to produce... it? it we, we weren't, you know, um, that wasn't there. We were dead broke, you know. Um, no money, um, which was very dispiriting. Um, and um, and then we, we just went into, then I went over to Jimmy for a month and then we came back in December. I came back in December and we were just in the practice room, in this practice room in the middle of the city, um, of Sydney. And um, it just wasn't, it was a, a bad atmosphere in the practice room. You know, th there just wasn't, I didn't really want to be there. Um, Grant had had enough. Um, Grant had never played in any other band beside the go-betweens. Um, we were all t extremely tired. You know, like the, the major problem was, one, one problem was that we, we hadn't, we didn't have the money where, where we could go, OK, we've made a great album with 16 Lovers Lane. We've toured the biggest touring we've ever done in our lives, you know, for about nine months, solid on the road. Uh, you know, let's take a year off. You know, here's your $50,000, there's your $50,000, there's my $50,000, see you in a year. Um, it was like we had to write another record. Grant and I are writing again, you know, like our seventh album in nine years, you know. Um, and Sydney had lost the luster of 16 Lovers Lane. I know I'm giving a whole lot of reasons, but they all just added up and it was like, that's enough. 
Because having heard the um, those botany tapes, I think that would have been just an incredible record. It would have been. Look, it would have been a stunning record. It, it, it would have. It would have been an amazing record. Um, and um, but it didn't happen. You know, it wasn't meant to be. Um, because at the time when you split the group up, one of the things that you said was uh, that you felt that. Lovers Lane was the sort of ultimate go-betweens record and that mm. it was time to stop there. Mm. Is that true, do you think? I think it's a good place to stop. Um, I think... Uh, I think it all leads up to 16 Lovers Lane. And if the band was going to go on, um, it would have had to have been a serious tack left, right, under. And I think that's where we got stuck. Where were we going to tack to? Um, we didn't want to make 16 Lovers Lane 2 and if you listen to the songs on that demo 16 Lovers Lane 2 is not there it's a whole different record I mean we're, we're, it was going to um, we were going to call it Freak Child you know like and that was the title that I had and um, Grant liked it and we'd present it to the record company you know and it was going to be called Freak Child wherever that was going to go and um, but it you know it, it required a sense of will a sense of you know um, the, 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 you know, you need cooperation and you need sort of, yeah, let's go, you know. Um, and it, it, it wasn't there in the band at the time, you know. That's something I learned from um, REM. Like, um, when I, you know, like looking in, into that band and being on the road with them, we were at a, a, um, a party and, um, at Michael Godinsky's house. And it was, because um, they, they brought out REM. We're on tour, and um, um, everyone was there, like lots of people, you know, like all the rock people and all the touring people, and um, Peter, Peter, no, REM were there, and 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 um, and Peter Bark, I, I hope, I, I know he doesn't mind me saying this, uh, you know, like had had too much to drink and was in a state, and he fell off his chair. A whole lot of people. It was in day, you know, like four o'clock in the afternoon. First person there pick him up, Michael Stipe. You know, I saw Stipe came from there, was there in front of everyone and picked him up. And I went, fuck, you know, that's something. You know, that wouldn't happen with our band. And I thought, that's how it happens, you know. And that's how you get a band to be the best band in the world. It's right there. <laughs>